The stone is 13.6 meters long, 3 meters high, 3.3 meters wide, and weighs, by some estimates, between 5 and 600 tons. The Israeli guide, in a broad Glaswegian accent, <laughs> asked the assembled group to try to explain how it got there, how they, in those days of thousands of years ago, could move an object so large, cut it so finely, and lay it so exactly against the other stones which made up the, uh, the, the western wall upon which the <coughs> temple was built. And of course, after lots of speculation, the answer is no one actually knows how, in those days, they could move such an object. The guide, um, the guide <coughs> turned the stone into a metaphor. He pointed out that the Romans, when they cast down the stones from the temple in AD 70, had tried to move that stone, and they chipped away at the top of the stone, and he pointed out to the irregular edge there. But then he said they couldn't move the stone. This is us, he said. We, the Jews, they try to get rid of us, and they can't budge us. What a remarkable metaphor that is, given what we just read in Zechariah chapter 12, that Jerusalem will be a burdensome stone to all the nations that come against Jerusalem. Who do you think said that quotation there? You can see how the Jewish past is engraved in the Jerusalem stone. Yes, Vladimir Putin. He visited uh, in his own uh, midnight journey to Jerusalem. He wanted to see the two holy sites which have special feeling, the Church of the Sepulchre and the Western Wall. It was the 26th of June, 2012 and he made that comment. It's remarkable that he has been voted by the Jerusalem Post the Person of the Year for 2015. We are living in remarkable times. This is the most stunning relationship between Russia and Jerusalem, which actually goes right through the history of Jerusalem since uh, medieval times. Brothers and sisters, we are living in amazing times. Russia is in the Middle East. Russia is encamped next door to Israel. The United States is withdrawing its interest and its willingness to fight and lose lives. It seems to be in its own sort of chaos. Europe is in turmoil. The Middle East refugees have brought the Middle East into the heart of Europe. Europe doesn't know what to do about it. It's going to have to reshape itself. And Jerusalem's peace is in shatters. It is a daily reminder of what the prophecies have told us about the burdensome stone it will be to all those who think they can solve this issue. So we come, then, sisters, to Zechariah chapter 12, and we see there the prediction that is our subject today. And as we think about this, I'd like us to turn to Psalm 102, please. <clears throat> Psalm 102, on verse 12. But thou, O Yahweh, shalt endure forever, and thy remembrance unto all generations. Thou shalt arise and have mercy upon Zion, for the set time to favour her, yea, the set time is come. For thy servants take pleasure in her stones, and favour the dust thereof. So the heathen shall fear the name of Yahweh, and all the kings of the earth thy glory. When Yahweh shall build up Zion, he shall appear in his glory. He will regard the prayer of the destitute and not despise their prayer. This shall be written for the generations to come 
And the people which shall be created shall praise Yahweh, for he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven did Yahweh behold the earth, to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those that are appointed to death, to declare the name of Yahweh in Zion, and his praises in Jerusalem, when the people are gathered together, and the kingdoms to serve Yahweh. The set time of Jerusalem is about to be fulfilled when the Lord Jesus Christ will come in answer to our prayers to deliver us from the bondage of this corruption and to establish that kingdom of righteousness and peace when all the earth shall learn the truth of the one creator of heaven and earth. Could there be more exciting times in which to live? This section of scripture, Zechariah 12 to 14, is uh, complex but fascinating. When you look at, uh, I hope you will look at your Bibles as well as the screen. I, I'm not put everything up on the screen. I'm hoping that you have enough light uh, to look at your, your own scriptures there. You'll see that the siege and deliverance of Jerusalem uh, in chapter 12 is repeated, of course, with different detail in chapter 14. So there are two accounts of the siege and the deliverance of Jerusalem. The deliverance by God. He intervenes through the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints. And then the second half of chapter 12 and the last part of chapter 13, we have reference to Messiah, no doubt about it. They shall look upon him whom they have pierced and mourn. And then chapter 13, verse 7, uh, smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered. Clearly two messianic references separated by this middle section which is about cleansing the land from false teaching. And that's an interesting perspective. You know, we're fascinated, of course, by political events. We tremble at the prospect of military events. We know these are signs of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But at the heart of the message of Zechariah is that Jerusalem is going to be a city of truth. It will be, chapter 8, verse 3, the city of truth. That's what God wants. He wants truth at the center of the place where he will be worshipped. And Jerusalem today is not like that. For all the religious fervor that is generated by and in Jerusalem, truth is not the feature that is noticed. Superstition, human imagination, wishful thinking, but God will sweep away the lines and establish Jerusalem as a city of truth. And Yahweh shall be king over all the earth. That's the prospect. Now this siege is a, is a terrible thing to contemplate and it is extraordinary. I suppose providential that what we see today happening in Syria and what we have seen happening in Chechnya is with a heavy heart we have to say what is going to happen to Israel and to most of Jerusalem. It's a dreadful thing. Nations are going to come up against Jerusalem to battle. Who are these nations? Of course the Gogian Confederacy will make up a large part of that assembly. But there will be others there. And I think it's quite interesting to see in chapter 14 the, the contrast, the balance between verse 2 and verse 16. So verse 2 of Zechariah 14 says, For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. So this phrase, all nations, it has uh, links to Abraham and the, the promises that in him all nations of the earth would be blessed, but they're going to come against Jerusalem. And the controversy of Zion is a controversy that God has with all the nations of the kingdoms of men. And they will be turned, as verse 16 says, those that remain of them into a host that comes to worship. Verse 16, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which come against Jerusalem, shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, Yahweh of hosts. 
So it seems to me that the all nations is there defined as all nations of the earth. And there would have been a many a time in the past when Bible students would have wondered how that was conceivable, that all nations could be mustered in this way. Uh, but nowadays, brothers and sisters, young people, is it so inconceivable, so difficult to imagine that now in this latest stage that Russia will lead all nations in a religious crusade against Jerusalem. That we've seen, and we have the United States has, has led United Nations coalition of forces uh, in Kuwait and Iraq and Bosnia, where the military power of a few countries is there representing the political will of all countries. And I imagine myself that that is what is going to happen. And it's a fearful thing. This is what happened a few years ago to a capital city of a region of Russia. This is what Russia did to its own, it claimed, Chechnya. And Grozny was the most destroyed city on earth. <coughs> It did it because it's, Russia said, this is our country. And that's why I think Russia is the force that will be able to impose that which is still required in the Middle East before the Lord Jesus is manifest. We find it hard to believe that that is the state of a country today in 2016. That is one of the oldest civilizations on earth. And now faction against faction, and then superpower has <laughs> smashed a whole country to ribbons. And it is an awful prospect to consider that. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The Lord Jesus contemplated the awfulness of the siege of AD 70 and the terrible consequences that would follow. And we can only share a terrible sense of grief for what is going to happen because of their unwillingness and stubbornness over centuries to accept what the scripture says of themselves. But why only half the city goes into captivity? Zechariah chapter 14, um, why only half? That's what it says. Half the city shall go forth into captivity. And you see the devastation and the, uh, the fact that you know, Russia, the Syrian president, have no qualms but to destroy everything that they feel is in their way. Well, surely it must be this. It must be that half of that city is to be protected and that seems to me to be the only explanation why that should be. You know, um, Brother Thomas wrote uh, in Eureka about Zachariah. Um, this is summarizing Brother Mansfield's uh, editorial note. The author of Eureka believe that the future of those so-called holy places will contribute to the descent of Russia into the Holy Land in conjunction or with the blessing of the papacy. So even our earliest Bible students understood that those holy places may have a material place in the events which will lead up to the manifestation of the King in Zion. And they will, of course, given that only this half of Jerusalem remains. That, that means the rest has gone into captivity. That means the rest of the country has gone into captivity. We have this situation. And we have it today. That is a refugee camp in Jordan today. Housing thousands and thousands of refugees who fled. It's a picture, brothers and sisters, of what is going to happen to Israel in the very near future. And who could say this is imagination? Who could say this is 
you know, it's incredible. You're making it up. It's far-fetched. When brethren of yesteryear were writing their accounts, there weren't Jews in the land in any significant numbers at all. But now the scene is so set. Let mine outcasts dwell with thee, Moab. Moab, it's being prepared. It's organized. It knows how to set up refugee camps. It's primed to receive them. What about this? Extraordinary that it's Greece where the refugees are arriving. I wonder, and I'm glad to have thoughts on this. Joel chapter 3, verses 2 to 7. I will gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat, and will plead with them there for my people, for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. You could take that scattering amongst the nations as a historical reference to what had happened over a 2,000 year period. But again, referring back to Brother Thomas in Eureka, being assembled in the valley of Jehoshaphat and having laid siege to Jerusalem, they rifled its houses, ravished its women, and sent half of its population into captivity, many of whom they sell to the Greeks for slaves at vilest prices. So is this a prophecy still yet to be fulfilled? Will there be, and I speculate now, will there be some arrangement where Greece is paid to take refugees, given its parlous economic condition, uh, and now other nations of Europe are putting up barriers around Greece to stop refugees escaping from its borders. Just something to think about as one of those things which might develop more uh, firmly in the future. How will the siege be ended? Well, we're told that there will be two things. The Lord will smite all the people that have fought against Jerusalem with a plague, <coughs> dramatically described, leading to much speculation about what sort of plague this could be. And many seem to conclude that this is some sort of radiation, or one might say some intense form of heat and intervention by the Lord himself. But the second, in that day, a great tumult shall be among them, and they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbour, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbour. And isn't that a fascinating thing? You know, when the uh, pundits are trying to explain what goes on in Syria, <coughs> they explain how confused the whole situation is. Who can know who's on Whose side? Who is Russia bombing? Russia's bombing the terrorists. Yes, but, but they're America's friends. Well, who is America bombing then? Uh, is America actually supporting Al-Qaeda? And there's Hezbollah. And nearly so often Israel intervenes and, and bombs uh, a shipment of arms to Lebanon. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to see the reality of what Zechariah says, that there will be turmoil, there will be confusion, and the chaos ensued upon, you know, communications going down is something that the nations of the world are sort of building themselves up for because of this desire to, to group together with multiple competing interests, and soon as this, the lid is taken off, then there's chaos and confusion, as has been seen in Syria, as has been seen in Iraq, as is seen in Libya, where group fights group. And that is so much the tone of what goes on today. Just go back to chapter 12 uh, and the uh, main point uh, of verse 2. It's, it's an interesting expression, but it says, 
Behold, I make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, and they shall be in the siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And the ESV translates that last part. The siege of Jerusalem will also be against Judah. Now that is very interesting. Judah, the Jews. See, there have been many sieges against Jerusalem over the last 1900 years. Persians, Arabs, Turks, Albanians, Egyptians, Europeans of different sorts. But the point here is that it is against Judah and against Jerusalem. Help us, Israel. Preface to the third edition. The purpose is the gathering together of the hosts of the nations against Jerusalem to war, that the eternal spirit by Jesus, King of Kings, may smite them upon the mountains of Israel. And in concert with resurrected and living saints at the head of the armies of Israel, we establish the throne and the kingdom of David and subjugate all other kingdoms to this new power in the earth. It is this relation between the gospel, salvation and political events that makes the current time so highly interesting. It's a wonderfully interesting time, and sisters, but only because, only because these things portend salvation. And the greatest sign we have in our generation, the greatest sign that God has given us, a sign we take for granted so, so easily, we've become adjusted to, is the fact that Judah is there in Jerusalem. It's of huge significance. God has given it to us for faith. Now is the time for faith. Now is the time to understand that Jerusalem's set time is upon us. Now is not the time to drift away to the world, to be destabilized by the challenges of, of science falsely so called. Now is the time to resolve, to come closer and closer to the one who is going to appear and call us to that judgment seat. And then with the faithful of all ages, march to deliver Jerusalem. Brother Robert says in the Christadelphia in 1865, in Zechariah 12, where the epoch is the subject of prophetic discourse, we find the statement that the Lord shall save the tents of Judah and defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the nations which come up against them, and that he will pour upon them the spirit of grace and supplication, causing them to receive to receive their crucified Messiah. These words could not be applied to the present inhabitants of Jerusalem who constitute for the most part a motley aggregation of gentle barbarism in its worst forms and of whom the descendants of Judah form an insignificant and uninfluential part. It is obvious that before the situation of affairs at Jerusalem described in Zechariah's testimony can be realized, the partial restoration affirmed by Ezekiel must take place. These interpretations were not based on the ever-changing current political events. They were based on sound interpretation of Scripture, leading to expectations which sometimes went against the trend. And there's a good example in uh, the Bible magazine, uh, recently cited in 15, 1955, Brother Bilton in his book, The Apocalypse and the Gospel, wrote... Because Jerusalem must be possessed by the Jews prior to Christ's return, so that he might manifest himself to them as their deliverer and saviour, the ejection of Hashemite Jordan from there is a foregone conclusion. We can look then for developments which will result in Israel's getting possession of the whole city and for a dreadful conflagration kindled by that spark throughout the Middle East. And so we stick to sound interpretation of scripture we take the lead from the lord jesus himself the stone of israel a stumbling stone of our salvation the chief cornerstone and the disciples were marveling weren't they at the stones that herod had used to expand the temple and the the lavish buildings that were built upon it and said not one stone 
shall stand upon another. And Jerusalem would be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Daniel 9.27, <coughs> Romans 11.25, until. Jerusalem would be trodden down, but in the latter days, Judah would return. And Jerusalem would be in the hands of the Jews, unbelieving, but primed to believe. Who can deny what the Lord Jesus said? AD 70, the evidence is compelling. Hadrian hated the Jews. We read that he renamed the new city Aelia Capitolina. He ploughed around its would-be walls as they did in those days and fulfilled Micah's prophecy chapter 3 verse 12 he did it hating the Jews and all they stood for he named the city after his own family and Jupiter Capitolinus uh, one of their chief deities he banned the Jews from entering Jerusalem on pain of death. And Simon Sebag Montefiore in his book on Jerusalem, an autobiography, says, and I've quoted him many times, Jerusalem had vanished. Hadrian wiped Judea off the map, deliberately, renaming it Palestina after the Jews' ancient enemies, the Philistines. That's where Palestine gets its name from. Hadrian who hated the Jews, on pain of death excluded them, wiped their temple off the map, placed his own pagan relics and icons and sacrifices on that place where God had said his name would dwell, and changed the name of the whole area to commemorate Israel's bitterest enemies. And so most of the world wants to call it that today. The downtreading of the Gentile nations is a long and grim and at times despicable story. Jerusalem was the center of the world for the medieval mind, but in a mythical sense. So many, when they eventually got to Jerusalem, were bitterly disappointed by its squalor and, and by the awfulness of the behaviour of those who lived there. And Rome became the centre of Christianity, and Mecca the centre of Islam, and Jerusalem for, cent for centuries was often ill-attended and derelict. But Jesus says, until that history of Jerusalem is nicely sort of uh, indicated by this uh, inscription that was found after 1967 when the uh, archaeological explorations were allowed to proceed. Under the arch, Robinson's arch, there was a Hebrew inscription. It was discovered by Benjamin Mansard during his excavations. And it says, you shall see and your heart shall rejoice. Their bones shall flourish like grass. It appears to be a paraphrase of Isaiah 66, 14. And Mansard believed the inscription was placed there on the west wall of the temple by Jews who allowed back in Emperor Julian's day. There were three times when Jews had a small respite where they could go back to pray. Julian wanted to overturn the Christianity of Constantine. On the 19th of July, 362, he said, I shall endeavour with the utmost zeal to set up the temple of the Most High God. But the time was not yet. And he lost uh, his power very, very soon after that. 
and material that he had stored up to rebuild the temple. It's got that far, mysteriously burnt up. Uh, <coughs> and Christianity of that sort once again prevailed. When uh, Muhammad's uh, general Omar came into the city, he asked to be shown where the sanctuary of David was. And it was upon that site that eventually they built the building, later beautified by other Muslim leaders. But let me just read you a section from uh, Montefiore's book. Abn al-Malik, his dome, affirmed the supremacy of Islam and his Umayyad empire, challenged Christianity, outshone the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and emphasized the Muslims as successors to the Jews by building on the rock the foundation stone of the Jewish temple. In other words, what he's saying is that this building was quite deliberately placed there to show the Muslims as the inheritors of the legacy of the Jewish nation. It was there to replace the Jews. It's no accident. And if you listen to the news and you look at the websites, BBC and so on today, and you, you hear them talking about this site, which, which the Jews claim was the site of their temple once, and which the Muslims claim as their holy site. The two are inseparable. <coughs> this building was placed there because it was the site of the Jewish temple. What do you think? That was the whole point. So this new religion would outshine the previous. So no wonder it is the immovable stone. So you have two strands running through the history of Jerusalem in, uh, over the centuries. You have the theme of the, the dome and the, the, the Muslim ascendancy, but you also have the Christian interest, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre being representing that. And Catholic and Greek Orthodox monks have frequently fought battles over the right to repair the roof, to open the door, to clean the floor. And there's a very interesting story here. See, when President Putin was talking about what he did in Crimea 18 months ago, he made a statement which puzzled and still puzzles the world's media. What was he talking about? This is what he said. All of this allows us to say that Crimea, the ancient Corson or Kersonesus, and Sevastopol have invaluable civilizational and even sacral importance to Russia, like the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And that's what per uh, perplexed the world's media. What was he talking about? Why would this, um, you know, this chess player, who's thinking about all the moves ahead, say, Crimea for us? It's like the Temple Mount for you. Why would he make that link? Now, this again is my interpretation, but I think he was giving a warning to the world. Or at least it was reflecting his thinking. You see, the Crimea, the war, which killed 750,000 men, started in a dispute over the holy places. On the 10th of April, 1846, Roman and Greek Easter fell on the same day. Catholic and Orthodox monks raced to be the first to set up their altar. The Orthodox got there first. The Turks knew that there was going to be a problem, but when their troops got in to stop it, 40 lay dead on the floor of the church. <coughs> the emperors of Europe were outraged on different sides, and the Crimean War began. Now you might say that's not the only reason for the Crimean War. Of course, there's a power struggle for who controls the Middle East, but the flashpoint, which was a serious issue, was those holy places. 
Brother Thomas understood this. He understood it. And I've already quoted you what he said. Um, and so he, he wrote a book in 1854. And the title is Egypt and the Holy Land by the British. The formation of a Russian Latino Greek confederacy. The invasion and conquest of Egypt, Palestine, and Jerusalem. Can you see the phrase Russian Latino Greek Confederacy? His tribunal is the holy city, for there he will sit to judge all the nations. Now look what it says. This exigency of the approaching future is the scriptural reason of that prominency which is given to the holy shrines in Jerusalem by the present Eastern question. And Putin says, Crimea for us is like the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. He's making a historic connection and a warning, I think, to the West. Don't try anything. The Latino Greek Confederacy. Look at the date 12th of February 2016. Once in a millennium. They've not met for a thousand years. And just now they've met. The head of the Orthodox Church of Russia and the head of Roman Catholicism at Rome, starting that rapprochement, which is a requirement for that image to stand upon its feet with a religious motive to come against Jerusalem. Well, after the Crimean War, uh, Palestine was open. Western interests. Until the Crimean War, most of the pilgrims that went there were Russians, actually. Did you know that? I did know. Most pilgrims to Jerusalem were Russian. Every Russian believed that the pilgrimage to Jerusalem was an essential part of the preparation for death and for salvation. But the Crimean War made Jerusalem even more important. Even though most of the fighting was away in the Crimea, this war placed Jerusalem at the center of the world stage where she has remained ever since. The center of the world stage. One visitor was Edward Robinson, and he uh, found part of that uh, temple wall, uh, or the, the retaining wall, and, and his name is given to the arch there. Uh, what he found in Jerusalem was a very, very small and squalid population. You can see, you know, just how derelict it was. You know, alone in people's minds, Jerusalem might have been an important place. In reality, it wasn't. It was a backwater. It was of no strategic value. Uh, superpowers might fight over access to holy places, but probably that's as far as it went. He wrote uh, a book on his... Uh, researchers and, and I just put up for you to see perhaps if you can see the top line and he says the glory of Jerusalem has indeed departed. So what I'm trying to say is that throughout its history there were of course were times when Jerusalem became important but it wasn't the main place. It wasn't the cause of world wars. It wasn't the center of international tension. Every so often it would flare up but you know, the colonies were elsewhere. The action was elsewhere. Jerusalem was disease-ridden. The stench was awful. Visitors uh, could hardly bear to walk through it. One of the first photographs ever of Jerusalem shows what it was like in 1844. Karl Marx, interestingly, wrote about the condition of the Jews there. There were a few, a few thousand. Nothing equals the misery and suffering of the Jews at Jerusalem, inhabiting the most filthy quarters of the town. The constant object of Muslim oppression and intolerance, insulted by the Greeks, persecuted by the Latins, and living only upon the scanty arms transmitted by their European brethren. 
Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until when is the set time to favour Zion? Well, the West, Britain was interested, and archaeologists went in to, to confirm for us today the reality of the history that the Bible describes of the first and second temple. But even then, although there was a lot of evangelical interest, there wasn't uh, overwhelming interest, certainly even by the Jewish community themselves. Even Herzl says in his diary, May the 7th, 1896, he spoke to the Sultan, and the Sultan says he would never give up Jerusalem. The Mosque of Omar must remain forever in the hands of Islam. We can get around that difficulty, I said. We shall extra-territorialize Jerusalem. Herzl didn't need Jerusalem. He didn't really want Jerusalem. He said, let it be an international city. Let everybody own it. Let it be a, a separate entity. But Jerusalem will be trodden down of the Gentiles until Zechariah 12, that Judah is in battle. There's a siege against them. They had to take it. And so we have the Balfour Declaration, which starts the process. Uh, almost didn't happen because it was an attempt to remove the Jewish Russians from Bolshevism. And the night before the Balfour Declaration was published, so we read, Lenin seized power. If Lenin had seized power a day earlier, then the Balfour Declaration probably would never have been made. And so the angels have worked on it and controlled it. Do you think that's significant? Well, Hamas believe today the Balfour Declaration is a crime against the Palestinian people. It should never have been made. But it's God's purpose that Judah would return. And so Allenby goes in. We know that he, uh, you know, he got off his horse. I, I was interested to learn that that was a, a memo from the Foreign Office sent to him, which said, strongly suggest dismounting. <laughs> it was on a world stage. The world is watching what happens to Jerusalem. But of course, other vested interests didn't want the Jews to have it. And so the Vatican, in 1945, before the Palestinian question had been turned over to the United Nations, Jerusalem was the local point of concern in Vatican-Zionist relations. The Vatican, in its part, continued to insist that Jerusalem must be internationalized. Now, Herzl was happy for that to be the case. If this is an impediment to, to the Jews getting their land back, you have Jerusalem. The Vatican says, we don't want the Jews to go back and they can't have Jerusalem. So the state of Israel is born. Oh, you won't read that, but I, it's there for me to read. Prime Minister Ben Gurion, 5th of December 1945. He made a statement to the world. Now just think of this in terms of Isaiah's prophecy, which says, let the nations be gathered together. Israel, you are my witnesses. 1949. The fact that we are members of the United Nations makes it imperative for us to state from here to the assembly. From the platform of the first Neset of Israel, to all the nations gathered together in the general assembly. All the nations gather together, says the Prime Minister of Israel. Let me tell you about Jerusalem. King David was here 3,000 years ago. We do not admit for one minute that the United Nations will try to take Jerusalem by force. And that word admit, I think, uh, has a special meaning there. In other words, we, of course, don't think you're going to try and take Jerusalem. Of course, we do think you're going to try in Jerusalem, and we will not for a minute concede the possibility that you will take Jerusalem from us. We declare that Israel will not give up Jerusalem of its own free will, just as throughout thousands of years it has not surrendered its faith, its national identity, and its hope to return to Jerusalem and Zion despite persecutions which have no parallel in history. Zion's time was coming. What did the Catholic Church say? In the Vatican newspaper, 
Observatoire Romano declared modern Zionism is not the true heir of biblical Israel, but a secular state. Therefore, the Holy Land and its sacred sites belong to Christianity, the true Israel. It's never given up that view. It holds that view today. Israel has no right to be there. They are the rightful heirs of that legacy. Well, Israel did capture, and you know this well, in 1967. And this is what Moshe Dayan said there on the 7th of June, 1967. We have united Jerusalem. That's interesting in terms of Zechariah 40, half the city. We have united Jerusalem, the divided capital of Israel. We have returned to the holiest of our holy places, never to part from it again. There is an undue confidence which so sadly we know is going to have to be shattered. But Jerusalem became in 1980 the indivisible capital of the state of Israel. The burdensome stone's profile is rising all the time. What a sign! The United Nations, I will bring all nations against Jerusalem. The United Nations, six UN Security Council resolutions on Israel have denounced or declared invalid Israel's control of the city. The United Nations, the Security Council, the assembled nations of the world say Jerusalem's occupation by Israel is illegal. And they're going to enforce what they believe to be their legal right. East Jerusalem is occupied territory. And of course Israel has exacerbated that in the eyes of the world by building more settlements in East Jerusalem and in the West Bank. But that's the territory that Ezekiel 38 requires Israel to have when Gog invades the mountains of Israel. And so after 1967, of course, the archaeologists were allowed free access now to most of the area to prove that the history that we know did actually happen. Robinson's Arch, that's what it looks like. It was the staircase leading up to the temple. The stones, the stones which were cast down are there as a witness to the world. Yes, they should make us think. Anyone who's seen them should reflect on what that means for us today. We know they found in, after 67, a wall from the time of Hezekiah with houses broken up to build the wall, just as Isaiah 22 says. The house of David, for long thought to have been a figment of Jewish imagination, has been found written on stone. The Tel Dan Stel, the house of David, mentioned in Zechariah chapter 12. Those of the house of David in the siege against Jerusalem. Houses from the time of Jeremiah, Bully, baked hard in the fires of Jerusalem have been uncovered. Men whose names are written in the book of life, Jeremiah 36 verse 10. Baruch, Gemariah, their names found on their seals. And one of my favorites, the wall of Nehemiah. Not so much of a wall, but a pretty impressive wall, given the circumstances. A wall of faith, a wall of courage, a wall of Ordinary brothers and sisters in ecclesias working together under the times of trouble and pressure to make sure that there is a wall in Jerusalem, that the faith of the hope of Israel stands tall, that there is in the last days a light that shines, a beacon of faith for all who might be wavering under the pressures of this world. Yes, it should make us think. The pool of Siloam, where the blind man washed away his blindness through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ and walked back up to the Temple Mount as a witness. And the relics of incense not offered, prayers not heard in the burnt house. And one of the great things, of course, was the opening up of the Western Tunnel to go beyond the traditional wall where the Jews were allowed to pray and go further and further up along that wall. The Western Tunnel opened up 
In September 1996, Netanyahu and the tunnel that ran from the wall on the Temple Mount to emerge in the Muslim quarter, 75 people were killed because of that bit of archaeology. Jerusalem, the burdens of stone. There it is, there's the stone. And you walk past the stone, you come to a little alcove where the women will want to pray as close as they can physically come to where the holiest of all was. Such a controversial place. The Muslims above ground, the Jews below ground. And it came to a head in 2000. The Camp David Agreement broke down. And it broke down over mainly Jerusalem. Of course, there's controversy about why it exactly did break down. But the fate of Jerusalem as a place of Jewish supremacy was the point at issue here. Arafat's aides admitted Jerusalem was his personal obsession. This is what Israel proposed in July 2000. The old city would remain under Israeli sovereignty, but Muslim and Christian quarters of the Temple Mount would be under Palestinian sovereign custodianship. The earth and tunnels beneath the sanctuary, above all the foundation stone of the Temple, would remain Israeli. In talks later that year, Israel offered full sovereignty on the Temple Mount, keeping only a symbolic link to the Holy of Holies beneath. But Arafat rejected this. What Israel wanted was the stone. Of course, it was evidence that they were there first. It was evidence of their history. And what Arafat wanted was to deny that to Israel. And so he said, Jerusalem had never been the site of the Jewish temple. That's what he said. This infuriated Clinton and then led Prime Minister Ehud Barak to sarcastically ask Arafat, where do you think Jesus drove the moneylenders from? The mosque? <laughs> <laughs> On that camp, David broke down. Peace for the world was shattered. On the history of the stone and of the ground. And so, to deny the temple has become official Palestinian authority policy. Their archaeologists must say there is no proof there has been a temple. Recently, they have put out, the Temple Institute has drawn attention to a leaflet put out by uh, the, uh, the mosque authorities denying that there ever was a Jewish temple, never mind two Jewish temples in Jerusalem. And he goes even further, Middle East Quarterly made an astonishing uh, statement that many Palestinian Arabs, including such prominent figures as Yasha Arafat and Faisal Husseini, claim that Palestinians descended from the Canaanite tribe, the Jebusites. Now why do you think they'd want to be descended from the Jebusites? You see, it's all about who has priority over the holy places of Jerusalem, the burdensome stone. We were there when this digging was going on in 2000, August 2000. And archaeologists were dismayed by the destruction of, of evidence that there might have been a temple there. And now a sifting project is going on, still finding evidence from the first temple period. But what's happened now, of course, and you know this in recent times, that the Al Aqsa Intifada, this interest that Jews have in the temple, this under underground work which they are accused of undermining the foundations of the Al-Aqsa compound has become a cause celebre for the whole world. President Abbas, this is a peaceful uprising. And where is it occurring mainly? Jerusalem. Our press doesn't report the frequency of these things. Interestingly, the Russian press does, and in a very 
much more objective way. The Russian press report that Israel threatens media action over misreporting. The particular case in point was the CBS, which published a headline, Three Palestinians Killed as Daily Violence Continues. Now, you've read those BBC headlines, Three Palestinians Killed. The fact is they were trying to kill other people isn't part of the headline. Israel protested, the headline was changed. But the world is turning, whether it's in Sweden or the British liberal media, the world is turning, and it will turn even more. It's not just Jerusalem, of course. This is the uh, torching of Joseph's tomb, 16th of October, 2015. Joseph's tomb. Where are the flashpoints in the Middle East? Hebron, Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Naples, Shechem. This is what the scriptures are telling us. It's the controversy of Zion. And you say, son of man, prophesy to the mountains of Israel and say, O mountains of Israel, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, because the enemy said of you, aha, the ancient heights have become our possession. That's what it's going to be at the center of it. Of course, there will be other motives for governments to be drawn in. But for God to bring these nations here, it is the controversy of Zion. It's the truthfulness of his word. It's the history of his people, which will be the point of crisis for the nations of the world. Catholic and Orthodox, making overtures to the PLO. And what's the United Nations doing while all this happens? Well, look, this was Ankara 2014. I've been following the conferences the United Nations have had. There was a conference in Africa. I thought, oh, what are they going to talk about? Malaria, AIDS? No, they're going to talk about the legal status of Jerusalem. There was a conference in the Pacific. In the Pacific, Vanuatu, Fiji. You know? What are they going to talk about? Global warming and rising sea levels. The legal status of Jerusalem. They get together in, in Ankara. And what are they going to talk about? The international meeting on the question of Jerusalem. And they got together in December, just recently, where Jakarta, the international conference on the question of Jerusalem. I will bring all nations, brothers and sisters, that's going on now, the policies are out there. What happens in Jerusalem reverberates around the world, Secretary General tells Jakarta meeting. That in Indonesia, that as far around the world they are coming back as you can get. And they're talking about Jerusalem. And now look what's happening. Al Jazeera, the Moscow-Jerusalem axis over Syria. Just look at the headline. The Moscow-Jerusalem axis. Al Jazeera, February 2016. The Jerusalem Post, our world, Israel, and that's a Christian Gelfian lecture subject <laughs> from a hundred years ago. <laughs> but it's in the Jerusalem Post just now. And just one final point for you to think about. Who is the house of David in Zechariah chapter 12? Who are they? The house of David is going to mourn. Well, I was just entranced to see that there is a movement to try to identify who the house of David is, offering to use modern genetics to define those people who can legitimately say they are descended from the house of David. So that might develop even further, that those in Jerusalem at the time of this great crisis will say, that's who we are. We are Judah of the house of of David. Jerusalem, the burdensome stone. And sisters, as we look at this, young people, as we look at these things, now is the time for faith. Let us lift up our heads and rejoice as our redemption draweth nigh.